Hello, everyone. My name is Alex. I'm here from TechCrunch to talk a little bit about the startup world, the pandemic, what has changed and what is the same. I'm very lucky to have Jeff Ralston from Y Combinator here with me today. Jeff, uh, before we get into all the work stuff, you doing good? Family safe? Everything okay? Thanks for asking, Alex. Yeah, everyone uh, is really doing great. Um, I, I feel very fortunate, in fact, because Life is pretty good right now, and it's a really tough world out there. But yeah, everything's good. I hope the same is for you and your family. Yeah, no, we're doing good. I feel like you and I are living kind of the, the software company life during the pandemic. We're doing fine. Well, there's a lot of struggling out there in the, the broader market. Uh, yeah. But let's talk about the pandemic and, uh, and what's changed. You know, if we go back to the March, April timeframe, startups were culling staff, pulling back on spend, thinking a lot about, you know, extending runway, trying to figure out ways to make sure they have plenty of cash. And then it felt like over the summer, much more aggressive investing, startups raising extension rounds to go out there and really leverage on growth. Uh, where are we today in terms of the risk on risk off sentiment inside the startup world? You know, I have to admit, I've been surprised at how seamlessly the venture world transitioned to investing over Zoom. I think that's sort of a, um, the, the, the biggest wake up that I've had during this whole pandemic is that it, it turns out that they haven't slowed down much. I think there was a little slowdown right in March, April, May timeframe when we didn't really know what was going on. And then sort of seamlessly, they just got back to business and so did startups. So I would, uh, I would say that the, um, the overall perspective is super positive. Lots of folks are, are starting companies as many as ever. We we're getting applications that, at, um, at rates that are similar above what we got last year. And the, uh, the quality of the founders is terrific. The summer batch, we can talk more about that, which was entirely virtual, went great. The fundraising of that batch afterwards went great. It's still going great. So I'd say overall, we're, the, the signs are mostly or even all positive. Yeah, it feels very risk on right now. I mean, that's what I keep hearing from people at the kind of early, middle and later stages of the VC community. It's amazing how fast things things flipped uh, over the summer into this more bullish perspective. But you know, when you're talking to, uh, let's just say companies from the summer batch of YC that are now, you know, graduated in the market operating kind of under their own steam. Do you guys say that they should have, you know, more cash than you might have a year ago? Is there any uh, push to be a bit more conservative on the financial side, the investing side for these companies? Yeah, I think, you know, look, uh, the advice we give startups now is not radically different than we give all the time. You know, Paul Graham wrote this essay a long time ago about being default alive. And it's always good to be default alive, to try to find a place where you can survive without raising more money. I would say it's more intense now. So think just a little bit harder about getting to product market fit and making sure you have product market fit and being honest with yourself about it. And, you know, um, conserve cash. If you're, we always say hire slowly and fire quickly. Well, hire even more slowly than you might otherwise and be more careful. And growth is obviously key to, to startup success, but you need to think about how you're growing and when you're growing and whether you're doing it in an intelligent way more now than ever before, just because the economy is so uncertain um, that, you know, before the election, that was even more true. But I, I, now what, what is 2021 going to look like? I think is an open question that is very difficult for, for anyone to answer. So creating a startup in that environment, I think you have to be just a little bit more wary of the, um, of the, you know, potential pitfalls out there. Does that, does that wariness uh, encourage startups to get a little bit more serious earlier about revenue growth? I know that YC plays at the very early stage. A lot of companies at Demo Day are still developing their product, aren't even out there yet, which is totally fine. But it seems that if the, if the market was a bit more uncertain and investment was a little bit less uh, you know, obvious or like determined to happen, um, are you telling companies to get you know, a bit sooner on the revenue pedal? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't really know how to parse that. Some companies, it's, it makes sense to go after revenue. That's what default to life means, by the way, is get revenue, get enough income. So in the worst case scenario, you can survive on, on your revenue. And it's always a smart thing to do. If you're going to measure how your startup's doing, revenue is always the best metric. Now, it's not the only metric, and it depends on the startup you have and what you're trying to build. 
and what you believe the appetite of venture capitalists to fund growth without revenue. So uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know really how to parse that. Some companies should go to revenue um, as early as possible, and some shouldn't. Whether that pandemic changes that or not, look, it's it's better to be default alive during a pandemic and during uncertainty. So yeah, if you can get there, you should. Yeah, no, I was talking to a group of investors um, the other day about this, and they were talking about how you know ARR thresholds, revenue thresholds that used to be in play for the Series A, for example, have really changed around. And so I, I was kind of curious if that had impacted things at the uh, earlier seed stages, but it sounds like it depends on the sector, the customer focus, and kind of other things. So it's not a question you can answer um, in aggregate, Jeff. Is that fair? Yeah, uh, you know, obviously I will not pretend to be a, a Series A expert, but I do think that there's a whole different set of criteria that Series A funds need to put in place that, that is just different when you're, when you're just trying to figure out how to actually build that thing that people want and get, the, get it into their hands and figure out if you have a path to growth and to revenue. Yeah. So let's talk about um, the pace of innovation inside of startups. I've been going to YC demo days forever since they were down in the South Bay, since they were NSF. I went to the last couple uh, in a remote setting. So I've been through thousands of YC companies. Uh, and to be clear, I've always really enjoyed it. It's a, it's a fun day, a lot of enthusiasm and excitement and people just really getting hype about building stuff. But one thing that I noticed in, in the most recent batch this summer cohort was that um, a lot of companies were applying ideas to different geographies. And my favorite example of this was Bakai, uh, which was applying kind of the Shopify model to India on top of the WhatsApp platform. Brilliant company, great founding team, growing like all heck, fantastic. But are, are we seeing the same pace as we used to of kind of like net new startup ideas or are we more focused now on spreading out things we found out that work to new ge geographies where they haven't currently you know, made it there yet? Well, gosh, I guess your question is, what's the definition of a new startup idea? Because, uh, you know, I think that's, that's sort of an argument over what um, real innovation versus incremental innovation is. And again, that's a difficult thing for me to parse. Let me say this, though. The amount of, of creativity and innovation we see in the application set that comes in hasn't changed. Now, um, yeah, it is for sure. There's some trends about th people thinking about the future of work and and applying SaaS models to things that perhaps in one geography haven't really been built yet. For sure, that is the case. It's kind of smart to look at what works in an economy like the United States and say, hey, we can build that in India. But that doesn't mean that you don't see local innovation for local markets. You know, a, a company of ours, this, this isn't that new a company, but just as an example, called Misho in India, you know, they figured out a way to create a B2B marketplace for all these local sellers, mostly women in local villages and get them the goods they need. That wouldn't really work in the United States. It's just a, a completely local phenomenon and it's growing extraordinarily well. So it sounds like the answer then is a mixture of both. We are seeing kind of net new local things and also some applying of models. No, I, I ask because I agree with you that it's not a bad thing to take a model that works and apply it somewhere else. But I feel like the um, the era in which we got the sharing economy, we we had the you know the explosion in mobile. Those big platform style trends seem to have kind of been figured out. And so I'm trying to figure out what the next um, wave of change will be. You know, what the next platform play. Sure. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I was going to say that. That, um, that you know, people are creating new platforms and building on top of platforms. Like suddenly, it, it, maybe suddenly is the wrong term, but Spotify, Spotify, that um, Shopify, excuse me, looks like an extraordinary platform in which to build all sorts of businesses. And there's a number of YC companies that are doing precisely that. Um, I, I do think there's, a, there's, there's something that happens in new markets where you kind of leapfrog where platforms don't exist and you see a lot of fintech, uh, for example, uh, innovation happening in, company, in countries like India or Indonesia uh, in, in various places around the world, South America as well. But um, I, I don't know that, you know, as I think about whether there's this maturation happening in the set of platforms and that new platforms won't be built, I always think that that's kind of a, a dangerous thing to, to, to hypothesize because things are still moving so fast. Oh, to be clear, I think there will always be a next platform. I'm very bullish long-term about VR and so forth. So I, I don't want to say that we're done. We're definitely not. But um, well, just like yourself, VR, I spend a lot of time- VR and AR are an interesting um, topic as you bring them up because we still see 
lots and lots of, of innovative ideas there. And we still have to ask ourselves, when is that going to happen? But yeah, you, you know, take, take, take cryptocurrency, take the blockchains, still, you know, one of those platforms, we have an extraordinary company, Coinbase, which is built around the, the, the cryptocurrency, but still that platform hasn't really come into its fullness for sure. No, no, lots of work to be done there. And Brian Armstrong's done a great job building, I think, an $8 billion company over at Coinbase. Um, when you're thinking about the future, what areas of the startup world do you think are the most exciting? Are you particularly into, I don't know, BDC FinTech? Or what's a place where you see a lot of innovation around the world that makes you very excited about what's going to come next? I think that um, the one of the interesting things about the pandemic is that it's sort of accelerated how people are thinking about the future of X. And I think about the future of work, the future of school, the future of medicine, you know, you have, you have remote school, everyone's in remote school. And what does that mean? You have, uh, you have so much uh, innovation around telehealth and uh, around how we deliver medical services to folks. Even, even the fact of the pandemic, um, caused a ton of in innovation in how we actually think about treating and testing for illnesses. All those domains seem to just be turbocharged right now. People are thinking about different ways in which we can imagine the future faster than we would have otherwise today. Um, I'm also super interested in, in the idea of embedding cognition in all sorts of different areas. P people call, you know, people might say that's the AI. I, I just think about making software smarter throughout a lot of different domains, maybe every different domain. And I think that's really exciting and going to change the way we interact with pretty much every service, every business that we do, that we do actually interact with. No, I'm excited to hear that because I could really use it. I feel like what's amazing is that even in these, um, you know, modern computing systems that we live inside, everything is incredibly siloed, incredibly um, stupid compared to, you know, they can't, apps can't talk, my browser can't talk to anything else. It feels very, very 19, you know, 94 in the modern era. You think we would have gone further with that technology um, by now, Jeff? Yeah, it, sometimes it's still extraordinarily frustrating because when you do interact with something that knows you and and reacts to you in, in really positive ways. Then you go into you know, a doctor's office and they give you seven sheets of paper to fill out. You're, you're, it's sort of, it's stunning. So I do think there's a lot of innovation and a lot of progress to be made in all of those arenas. And I think one of the points you were making is that uh, getting different areas, different domains to talk to one another more effectively, that's going to be really interesting when we have more integration in our lives. And it's going to take some time to do that. They're super hard, super complicated. We can't even get different medical record systems to talk to one another yet. So <laughs> in one domain, but eventually I think we'll get there. Yeah, my spouse is a physician, so I'm incredibly aware of how bad the medical record world is. Um, I want to talk about the end of, of the pandemic. One thing that we've all seen in the last month or so has been, you know, good news about vaccines. There seems to be some optimism that uh, maybe by the end of next year, we could be almost back to normal. And I'm curious, you know, wh what does that leave open for startups? Should they begin planning more bullish investment scenarios for their budgets? Should they be thinking more about hiring plans? Like, what does the, the tail end of this aberration of an era mean for the companies that are growing the fastest? Well, I think for early stage startups, they should kind of ignore that and pay attention to what's right in front of them, get product market fit, grow when they do, and, um, and make sure the runway is as long as possible. Uh, I think, uh, you know, um, it is awesome that the, the two vaccine candidates um, Moderna and Pfizer seem to be over 90% uh, effective. I think we have to be a little conservative in how much that is going to affect businesses and the economy. We, you know, how many people are going to take the vaccine? How is it going to be dist distributed? All those things should give us a lot of pause. I'm pretty optimistic that the world will be in a very different place by the end of 2021. Um, but I don't think that that optimism would cause me to talk to a startup any differently and say, look, by the end of 2021, you should, I, I, I think that's a little, that's getting the cart before the horse for most of those folks. So just, it's fun to talk to you about this because this is, you're, you're being very clear. And so for, for the earliest stage startups, the, the macro climate seems to be relatively unimpactful. And you're saying, look, just niche down, laser focus on product market fit, 
make sure you have plenty of cash in the bank, get those early customers, iterate. And then once you figure it out, kind of go to market, grow like all hell. Is that fair? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I might add, find the right people for your startup because that's going to be more substantive than anything else. And maybe be a little bit even slower at that than you would otherwise. But yeah, uh, you know, focus on your startup core, all the, all the, you know, we, we call we're calling this talk essential startup advice in the time of pandemic, but really I would say read essential startup advice and, and, and pay attention to that. And, you know, maybe double down on some of the things that make most sense during a pandemic, like conserving cash and, and, and being perhaps a little bit more conservative on, on things like I've repeated a number of times, like how you hire and how you build your company. Um, but what you do want to do is, is, you know, this is always true for a startup, but you want to get to the other end, right? Whether it's the end of 2021 or, or Q1 of 2022, come out the other side and the, the startups that do make it through and survive and then can raise a series A and a series B are, are super well positioned, I think, to take advantage of, um, of what, let's, let's, let's be honest, what the pandemic has done is caused a, an, an earlier shift to digital to online that would have happened otherwise. And some of the companies that have been able to take advantage of that are, are flying high right now. Again, I, I feel it's almost crass to point out that people are, are, are being advantaged during this horrible pandemic that has caused so much suffering, but it's just a fact that certain companies have and will do very well by taking advantage of the, the, the shift to online. And the, the shift is secular. It'll, it will go back, of course. It's not going to remain, you know, completely remote all the time, for sure. But this, uh, I am persuaded, is a, is a, is a change that is fundamental and long lasting. And, um, and, and overall, this particular part of the change is positive, I think. Yeah. So we only have a couple of minutes left, but I want to get into just a, a topic that's been stuck in my head. So like I said, I've been to a bunch of, you know, YC demo days throughout time. And now that they're remote, you guys have been able to widen your net. Startups seem to be placed in different parts of the world and they don't have to be kind of in Mountain View or in San Francisco and so forth. You know, is that going to stay in, in the YC model? Because I'm hearing from startups that are really excited they can take part in uh, the last batch and the next batch of YC without having to move you know, across the world or the country. So you know, has it opened up your net? And then will we see some of this last in 2022 when COVID is behind us? For sure we will. We won't, I don't know exactly what YC looks like post pandemic, but it'll look different. Um, it is unquestionably true that aspects of running a room batch are actually better than in person. That, you know, it would have been hard to try as an experiment in the past. We might have eventually gotten there, but we were forced into it. Right. It is certainly true that it's way easier to interview and then fund companies that are very far away in Brazil or in India or in, in Southeast Asia than it would have been otherwise. And it's way easier for those folks to build their business, their local business especially, while they're on site there and yet still participate right. fully in YC. I think we'll see some sort of hybrid in the future, for sure, where we'll, we'll bring people together. It is human to human contact won't go away, thank God, right? We, it yes, matters. I miss it. It, it really matters. It matters to create ties between people and to create connection. Super important, not you know, just for business, but emotionally, it really matters. And, and we'll, 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 we'll try to recapture as much of that as we can. But it's certainly true that Remote YC has gone terrifically well. and and especially for the folks who aren't in San Francisco or the Bay Area, uh, or even in the United States, but far afield and, and how it, you know, we've been able to make YC incredibly practical, convenient, and positive for, for, the, for the success of their businesses. Well, Jeff, we are out of time, but I do appreciate you walking me through this. Um, I'm hoping the next time we talk, it won't be during COVID and we can talk about something else because I think it's all we've done for the last nine months, but thank you for your time. Good luck with YC's next batch and uh, back to Lisbon.